Welcome to The Global Current, where Seton Hall's diplomacy students give you a fresh look at what's going on in the world. I'm Alicia Sharabali. And I'm Jim Janos. This week's news. Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel's visit to South Korea for security talks. China's conviction of a real estate mogul. The United States expels Venezuelan diplomats. And an update on the mall shootings in Nairobi. In analysis, the effect of international sports on poverty reduction in Brazil. And China's economic expansion and its effect on the U.S. and Russia. Thanks for tuning in. And we hope you enjoy the show. Wish I could stand above and replant it. For the whole world is just one love and replant it. There's too much I just don't know. And now, staffer Katja Bibi reports on the gains made after Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel's visit to South Korea for security talks. The two Koreas, North and South, are still technically at war since the conflict in the early 50s ended in a ceasefire with no further developments or current prospects for a peace treaty. Since the Korean War, the U.S. assumed military operational control over the South Korean Army, which means the U.S. is obliged to lead South Korea's military as well as U.S. troops deployed there in the event of a war. The transfer of wartime control from Washington to Seoul is currently set to take place in 2015. U.S. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel arrived in South Korea this past Sunday for the 45th annual security meeting between the two nations, marking the 60th anniversary of the two countries' mutual defense treaty. During the course of his four-day trip, Secretary Hagel met with South Korean Defense Minister Kwon Jin Kim and announced on Wednesday that the meeting ended in a new military strategy agreement. The resulting agreement reflects the threat from North Korea's expanding nuclear and chemical weapons program. According to the Wall Street Journal, the defense agreement is designed to increase deterrence against North Korea's use of nuclear bombs and other weapons of mass destruction. The detailed content of the bilateral agreement has yet to be disclosed, but a South Korean military official told the journal that it allows for preemptive attacks in the case that Pyongyang prepares to use any of its nuclear weapons in an attack. The defense agreement also includes deterrence against North Korea's potential use of other weapons of mass destruction. South Korea's intelligence agency believes it possesses 2,500 to 5,000 tons of chemical weapons. Earlier this year, in February, North Korea launched its third nuclear test in clear violation of UN Security Council resolutions. This act of defiance sounded an alarm to the world and especially to South Korea. Tensions have grown between the neighbors ever since. At this year's security meeting, Secretary Hagel and Defense Minister Kim also discussed the possibility of delaying the transfer of wartime control of South Korean forces. Originally set to take place in 2012, the deadline has already been extended once. Secretary Hagel stated that the transfer timing will be based on military conditions and that no final decisions had been made on the issue. On the subject of a possible transfer extension and what it would mean for U.S.-South Korean relations, Secretary Hagel described the relationship saying both parties are constantly reevaluating our roles. That does not at all subtract from or in any way weaken our commitment, the United States commitment, to the treaty obligations that we have and continue to have with the South Koreans. Discussions will continue between the two nations on proposed transfer of control dates. A recently released progress report on the South Korean military observes that its military capabilities have improved in respect to communication and coordination with the U.S. on missile defense, but the South still needs to strengthen a number of military and intelligence capabilities, including surveillance and reconnaissance, as well as its missiles. This past summer, in a speech at the 60th anniversary of the Korean War Armistice, the Secretary of Defense reaffirmed Washington's commitment to securing the Korean Peninsula and, in extension, the entire East Asian region. We remain committed to helping ensure peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula. More than 28,000 American soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines serve in Korea today. Secretary Hagel's trip to South Korea included a series of ceremonial events and meetings with President Gunhae Park and other officials, as well as a trip to American troops. Upon touring the demilitarized zone between the Koreas, Secretary Hagel noted, there is no margin for error in guarding against a North Korean attack. Secretary Hagel continued his tour of East Asia by joining Secretary of State John Kerry in Japan. 
The two are attending meetings with Japanese foreign and defense ministers to continue to discuss security as it pertains to the region. This is Katsubibi for the Global Current. Last Sunday, China convicted real estate mogul Gong Ai Ai for illegally amassing dozens of properties. Yunfei Wang tells us more. China's economy has grown at a staggering rate over the past 30 years, but some problems, including one concerning the real estate industry, have recently been brought to light. Last Sunday, a female real estate mogul, Gong Ai Ai, was sent to prison for three years after being convicted of amassing dozens of properties by forging and illegally purchasing documents, according to China's state-run Xinhua News Service. Gong was the former vice president for the Shenmu Rural Commercial Bank. She was accused of buying up apartments in Beijing and the surrounding area by presenting illegally obtained national identity card and notoriously hard to get acquire required residency permits, known as hukou. Prosecutors believe her real estate portfolio was worth around $160 million. After Gong's exposure, poor and middle-class Chinese people who had been priced out of the nation's rapidly expanding property market began expressing their frustration at the issue. This case also provides an example of how government officials and executives at state-owned enterprises can use their positions to grow unimaginably rich, according to the New York Times. A recent case involving government corruption concluded last month when Bo Xilai, once one of China's most powerful officials, was sentenced to life in prison for crimes that include did bribe taking and embezzling funds worth $4.4 million. The cases underlying the importance of the anti graft campaign started by President Xi Jinping. According to the Guardian.com, Xi has vowed to cry down on tigers and flies, referring to both powerful leaders and lowly bureaucrats in his campaign against corruption and other abuses of power. This is Yunfei Wang from The Global Current. Kate Kozlova informs us on the expulsion of Venezuelan and U.S. diplomats from their respective posts. This Tuesday, Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro went on television to exclaim, Yankees, go home, before expelling three United States diplomats. He accused them of involvement in espionage and plots to destabilize Venezuela's economy. The U.S. Embassy defended the three diplomats, saying the accusations were baseless. The next day, Washington responded by expelling Venezuela's diplomats from their posts in the United States. They were given 48 hours to leave their posts, the same amount of time allotted to the United States diplomats in Venezuela. Maduro backed his accusations with evidence that alleged U.S. diplomats were directly tied to Venezuela's recent power outages by bribing energy firms to cut production. Reuters reports... He alleged that they had been meeting with right-wing opposition leaders and encouraging acts of sabotage against the South American nation's electricity grid and economy. All Venezuelan local TV channels were required to broadcast a video with a dramatic soundtrack of three diplomats entering and leaving pro-opposition offices in Bolivar. Foreign Minister Elias Huaya expanded on the accusations taking to television to say that in recent weeks, American diplomats attended meetings with democracy advocates, union members, and elected officials belonging to the political opposition, whom he accused of planning to destabilize the country. The U.S. State Department denied Maduro's allegations, saying that the officials were engaging in normal diplomatic activities and were meeting with a broad range of people from different segments of society. An official told the BBC, It is regrettable that the Venezuelan government has again decided to expel U.S. diplomatic officials based on groundless allegations, which require reciprocal action. The expulsion of Venezuelan diplomats was an action carried out in accordance with the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. Despite the frayed relations between the two governments, Reuters reports the United States remains Venezuela's main 
oil export market, receiving an average of around 800,000 barrels per day of crude and refined products each month this year, according to the United States government data. This has been Kate Kozlova for The Global Current. And staffer Arjun Dunde with a brief update on the aftermath of the Westgate Mall shootings in Kenya. It's been almost two weeks since the Westgate Mall in Nairobi, Kenya, was attacked by a group of radical militants. The armed assault resulted in the death of more than 60 men, women, and children. Days after the attack, terrorist group Al-Shabaab claimed responsibility. The group originated in Somalia and has long been suspected to have ties to many different terrorist organizations, including Al-Qaeda. According to the New York Times, the militants entered through Kenya's notoriously lax border crossings. The attacks was eventually halted by the combined efforts of the Kenyan military and police force. However, U.S., Canadian, and British investigative agencies are now looking into the attack in an attempt to apprehend all the responsible individuals. Results of their investigations have yet to be released as it is still ongoing. This is not the first time that the Kenyan military has clashed with al-Shabaab. Kenya originally entered Somalia in 2011 to combat this terrorist group. Al-Shabaab had in fact previously threatened to attack Westgate Mall and proved to have the military training and equipment necessary to carry out this attack. Kenyan forces combated the militants for approximately three days, during which time there were numerous deaths and injuries. The Wall Street Journal reports that the attack could cut about 0.5% of the nation's economic growth. This is because Kenya is a nation that relies heavily on its tourism industry. Since the Westgate Mall was a hub for tourists and expatriates, there could be multiple long-term effects. Arjun Donde, Global Current. This week's shout-out goes to Women for Women. There is a special screening of It's a Girl on Tuesday, October 8, 2013 in the Amphitheater at Seton Hall University. This documentary introduces us to the ongoing plight of women in China and India suffering from gender side. Check it out. And now an analysis, Bernie Lee takes a look at the effect of international sports on poverty reduction in Brazil. In the year 2000, all of the UN member states came together to establish eight goals to be achieved by 2015. The idea was to free people from extreme poverty and multiple deprivations. This was to become the Millennium Development Goals. Like with many good ideas, the devil is in the details. How do you overcome extreme poverty and hunger, achieve universal primary education, promote gender equality, and empower women, reduce child mortality, improve maternal health, combat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases, ensure environmental stability, develop a global partnership for development. These are all ambitious goals that require all sectors of society, laborers, capital owners, government, etc., to work together to achieve this lofty state of improved collective well-being. When discussing the collective good, it is hard to leave out the name Karl Marx, from the conversation whom is often paraphrased with saying that religion is the opiate of the masses. As we look at the development efforts of nations making fast economic progress, there may be a new drug on the market, sports. Brazil has shown remarkable progress over the past decade in achieving the Millennium Development Goals and may have developed a democratic model for progress that defies the previous model of the Asian Tigers, South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Taiwan. Freedom House, a Massachusetts-based independent watchdog dedicated to the expansion of freedom around the world, rates Brazil a 2 on a scale of 1 to 7, with 1 being the most free. Fellow leaders in democracy and economic development, South Korea and South Africa, also had ratings of 2 before they hosted the most recognizable international sporting event, the World Cup. Seoul, South Korea also hosted the Summer Olympics in 1988. It seems that a reward for economic development and cultural progress has been the opportunity to host such international sporting events. Much like the commercialization of Christmas in America, there may be a crucial detail the masses are overlooking amidst the rampant celebration. This past June and July, the world received a vivid glimpse of the growing disparity in Brazil's economic development. The fruits of political and economic plans are not readily seen immediately after the implementation. Stephen Levitt and Stephen Dubner, the rogue economists who coined Freakonomics, have illustrated how the effects of the 1969 ruling on abortion may have affected crime rates in the late 80s and 90s. Economists Reinhardt and Rogoff show how the perception of unsustainable debt levels have been the precursor to every major financial crisis over the last few centuries. I think it's safe to say that the effects of actions lag in relation to the data collected. 
two years after the announcement that Brazil will host the 2014 World Cup, we see fervent protests in the streets of Brazil. As we saw in South Africa, these sorts of protests aren't new. Millions of dollars are now being funneled towards stadiums, hotels, and infrastructure developments to service the deluge of wealth that the sporting event will draw. After the public catharsis in June and July, things seem to die down. During Brazil's Independence Day on September 7th, protests broke out yet again on massive spending for the World Cup and the Olympics. At the 25,000-foot level of aggregate data, the outlook for Brazil looks good when you consider the example South Korea and South Africa have set for developing countries who have hosted large-scale international sporting events. With a more detailed look, caution should arise as economic development projects have stalled due to the revenues from the coming and going of these international events. In shifting focus to infrastructure projects instead of employment and the solidification of key core industries, there could be debilitating effects in the long term. With a burdensome tax code and limited flexibility in their labor force, Brazil is a fragile system. This system might not be large enough to absorb the political costs of ignoring the development progress that has benefited many impoverished Brazilians. By hosting the World Cup and the Olympics in such close succession, we may have the opportunity to see the effects of this new social drug and whether it is possible to overdose on sports fervor. As celebrations fade and people sober up, will they be ready to pick up their shovels and hammers to continue progressing toward their future? This is Bernie Lee for The Global Current. Connor McDonough analyzes China's economic expansion and its effect on the United States and Russia. In the month of September, the world's eyes were focused on the power struggle between the United States and Russia over the conflict in Syria. Meanwhile, the People's Republic of China expanded its already significant influence in Central Asia. In the past month, China has signed several energy deals with Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan. These deals, totaling almost $100 billion, are just the most recent steps in China's march towards further economic involvement in Central Asia. Central Asia, comprised of the five former Soviet republics, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan, was once home of the famous trade route, the Silk Road, but it has been at the center of geopolitical conflict for over a century. The Great Game, as it's been described, was once played between the British and Russian empires. Today, the new Great Game is a competition between three of the world's most powerful players, Russia, the United States, and China. The United States entered the game late, as it did not show more than marginal interest in Central Asia until after 2001, when NATO invaded Afghanistan. Because of the geographic positioning of Afghanistan, Central Asia was needed, and is still needed, as a corridor to supply military forces in Afghanistan. This corridor is known as the Northern Distribution Network. As it is likely that the U.S. troops will be stationed in Afghanistan after 2014, the Northern Distribution Network will be essential to fighting the war. In an effort to foster relations in Central Asia, the U.S. government has helped introduce American corporations into Central Asia, both to gain access to its markets and make use of its labor force in manufacturing. U.S. investment has been economically beneficial for both parties, but also has roots in the hopes of politically liberalizing Central Asia through free market influence. The influence of other economic powers in the region will set back the work the U.S. has done and may even push out U.S. companies from Central Asian market. The United States' regional goals are jeopardized by increased Chinese influence in the region. The attempted liberalization of Central Asian governments through free market economics is weakened by increased business ties to autocratic China. U.S. corporations have difficulty competing with Chinese state corporations who will work within the region as China continues its economic expansion. The former ambassador to Uzbekistan for the United States sums up U.S. policy for the region well. The United States has a clear interest in making sure that no one power dominates Central Asia. The concern 20 years ago, and even 10 years ago when I was in Tashkent, was Russia. The concern today, if anyone has any brains and, and foresight, is China. Because uh, uh, Russia's influence is waning in the area, and China's is, is gaining um, daily. The next player is Central Asia's longtime occupier and main political and economic ally, Russia. Central Asia, known as Russia's near abroad, is an economic stronghold for Russia. Central Asia has been endowed with a preponderance of natural resources in the form of oil and natural gas. 
These oil and natural gas reserves are very lucrative for Russian companies, and due to the geography of the region, must go through Russia to get to European consumers. Russia has a continued interest in seeing that this oil and natural gas must cross through its borders, since this is a source of leverage for Russia's dealings with Europe. Russia is also attempting to create a customs union between itself and Central Asia. In essence, this union would create free trade agreements between all the countries within and increase tariffs for those not within the union. This would open new markets to Russian goods and lower the prices for Central Asian goods in Russian markets. Russia may no longer control Central Asia, but it still has many vested interests in the region. What China's new Silk Road economic zone could mean for Central Asia is much more than lucrative contracts. China's economic expansion will easily be able to be used as leverage in Central Asian affairs, even though China's new president, Xi Jinping, has said exactly the opposite. We will in no circumstances interfere in the internal China affairs China of Central Asian countries. China's continued expansion of non-economic programs to many types of influence. For example, the Chinese government has increased grants for Central Asians willing to learn Chinese and travel to China. In the case of Kyrgyzstan, China has expanded and developed training programs in Beijing for personnel within academic and government circles. This is only one example of how China is expanding its influence outside of economics in Central Asia, creating for itself a sphere of influence to its west. High-ranking government officials from multiple Central Asian states have stated that their relationship with China has now become a top priority in their affairs. The economic and political influence of China has begun pushing out Russia from Central Asia. The customs union would not include China, so China is pulling potential Central Asian states away from the economic boost to Russia. Russia, in turn, is relying on its past relations with the region for oil and gas contracts. While Russia has in the past had cultural and historical links with the region, the more recent multi-billion dollar deals from China have threatened their position. China's growing economic clout in Central Asia is likely to have much more of a geopolitical girth than it lets on, but only time will tell for sure. Connor McDonough, Global Current. And rounding out the show, staffer Anthony DeFlorio interviews Jean-Marc Kwaku about the UN's involvement in Syria. Dr. Jean-Marc Kwaku is a professor of law and global affairs and the director of the Division of Global Affairs at Rutgers University. He also is a global ethics fellow with the Carnegie Council on Ethics in International Affairs. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Kwaku. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So today we'd uh, like to speak to you a little bit about what happened at the UN General Assembly in 2013, among other things. There was primary focus uh, placed upon the speeches of United States President Barack Obama, newly elected Iranian President Hassan Rouhani, and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, among others. These are all important figures in the realm of international affairs. And so I would ask you, because of the very tense relations between all of three actors, in regards to their comments respectively at the United Nations, how can the United Nations help to facilitate the easing of tensions between all three actors and their respective states? I suspect that the conversations which took place between uh, President Obama and the uh, President of Iran and the Prime Minister of, uh, of Israel uh, have had much to do with, uh, with Syria. In fact, uh, Syria is the only issue which has been uh, very much uh, at the center of uh, conversations in the past week. So, you know, uh, I don't know uh, if uh, they have uh, come to an agreement on, 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 on what needs to be done about Syria, uh, since the focus is at the moment on chemical weapons and not really on how to, to solve the crisis uh, for, the, for the way forward. Mm. So what you're saying here is that the emphasis really has been on uh, still chemical weapons, the Syrian... Well, I mean, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, since Iran is viewed as uh, one of the main backers of uh, the al-Assad uh, regime, I think that the importance of the conversation between uh, the U.S. and uh, the phone conversation took place between uh, the uh, head of the U.S. and the head of uh, Iran. So, I mean, of course, uh, there is a, a long uh, dispute uh, between uh, Iran and the U.S., but I think that the main point uh, of discussion must have been Syria since, once again, uh, Iran is viewed as one of the main supporters of the Assad regime. And of course, since uh, there is this geographical proximity when it comes to Israel and Syria, uh, I'm sure that in the conversations between Netanyahu and Obama, Syria has been a key point. So how then do you feel about the United Nations taking a stronger, more active role? Because they have been stymied because of the United Nations Security Council and uh, other institutions within the United Nations itself, which have been inefficient. There have been many times where 
uh, progress has not been made as quickly as it should be. How can the United Nations take a more active role? Well, in a way, the tragedy is that the focus is now on the chemical, on the chemical weapons and not any longer on the crisis itself. I mean, the chemical weapons is only one, uh, in the end, relatively minor aspect of the crisis. So now that we are putting all our uh, diplomatic and political energy in addressing the chemical weapons issue is, is good, but it's certainly not enough. And that's one of the downsides of now uh, having the international community uh, focusing on the, on, the chemical we- on the chemical weapons is that there is no strong focus any longer on you know, truly trying to address the crisis because uh, you know, people continue to be killed on a daily basis. The fact that we are focusing so much now on chemical weapons allows uh, uh, the civil war to continue without being uh, really noticed. And so, Dr. Kwako, um, another question related. In terms of the United Nations Security Council, I, I guess I would post you a, a hypothetical. How would you go about reforming, making structural changes, presenting different options for how the Security Council can come together and make positive change on such issues that are very polarizing? You have a limited number of actors within the Security Council which are divided or abstaining, and so that again, stymies any progress. How would you personally uh, suggest any, any revisions, alterations, changes to the way that the Security Council operates? Well, uh, a reform of the, con- uh, of the Security Council has been uh, on the agenda for, for, for many, many, many years. The problem is that, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the countries uh, meant to endorse uh, the, the reform of the Council, that is, the, the five permanent members, also the ones uh, benefiting from the current situation, so uh, they have no strong incentive to really make it happen. So that's one problem. The second problem is that uh, uh, for potential uh, candidates uh, to become uh, permanent uh, members, uh, there is uh, much competition. For instance, the last uh, uh, attempt to reform the Security Council in the end, uh, as, you know, if I recall well, the, the um, African nations were not able to to to, to agree on. Uh, who would be the countries which they would put forward in terms of candidates for for uh, for permanent seats because there is a, a competition within any given region for for such seats. For instance, uh, uh, in in Africa, you will ha- you will find competition between um, South Africa and Nigeria. In in Asia, you will find competition. In Southeast Asia, you will you will find competition between Pakistan and, and India. So you have these two uh, difficulties, you know, at, uh, at the global level, uh, the countries uh, meant to endorse the possibility of a reform are the ones benefiting from the current situation, the permanent members, and therefore they don't necessarily want to really have a, a powers being diminished, uh, even though uh, the, the, the current structure of the council uh, undermines the very legitimacy of this council and of the UN. Um, in general, because it doesn't have uh, a very, very strong uh, uh, claim to being representative of the world as it stands today. And then at the regional level, well, you have competitions among the regional powers. uh, And, uh, for instance, in Africa, Nigeria doesn't want to see uh, 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 South Africa being enhanced by such a seat. And in, in the context of Asia, Pakistan doesn't want to see India, or India doesn't want to see Pakistan being enhanced by obtaining such a seat. So it's very complicated. But of course, you see, uh, uh, it's not sure that if we had more members, uh, the ability of the council to really uh, move forward in terms of uh, deciding on 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 difficult matters uh, would be great because um, you know it's you know once you 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 argue that uh, uh, any kind of veto uh, makes it impossible to move forward in terms of a, of a given policy um, so in the end you know I guess that uh, the solution would have to be uh, um, you know, connected with re- removal of, of the veto power. Hmm. Thank you, Dr. Koko. We thank you so much for joining us today and bringing your insights and your experience to our School of Diplomacy at Seton Hall University. Uh, thank you, sir, and thank you for, for having me on the program. Thank you for tuning into this week's show of The Global Current. 
check us out at blogs.shu.edu slash global current. And make sure you follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. This has been Jim Janos. And this is Alicia Sharabali. And we'll see you next week.